Market Hub. Buy, sell, list, connect. Nairobi, the capital and largest city in the Republic of Kenya. A bustling East African city established as the business hub of the region. We're here to meet with a world-renowned petroleum expert and an advocate for developing women leaders. A leader, a trailblazer, a mother. We're here to meet with an African who is aptly described as a phenomenal woman. Hello Africa, I'm Mary Mukindia and this is my African dream. You are, of course, a very prominent and well-known oil and gas expert. Um, so tell us, how did you, how did that happen? And how did you get to where you are today? It was very much an accident, actually, uh, moving into the oil and gas industry. I didn't even want to work in Kenya. I'd gone for a, an ISEC um, University Students Organization for Business Students in Turkey okay. and loved it so much that I wanted to stay and my father wouldn't let me or give me the money to go back. So when I graduated in 80, I simply, you know, didn't talk to him and <laughs> didn't want to work, you know, insisting to be taken abroad. And in the end, it wasn't coming. So I looked out for a job, I applied, and I, those days was easy. In yeah. the 80s, I got three job offers. And eventually, more like potluck, a friend of mine had a brother in Esso, so I went into the oil industry again and, and loved it, never left, okay. actually never left till today. Fantastic. Yeah, 35 years later. Wow. And it is an industry that's not really associated with women. So how were you able to break through the glass ceiling? She had work and maybe a bit of a loud mouth. <laughs> uh, having been brought up by a single father and he was very much a disciplinarian and, and he was a workaholic, he used to work Saturday, Sunday. He worked for the railways for over 35 years. So we all treated exactly the same. We competed yeah. with the boys. Yeah. And um, I just grew up knowing that's the way life runs. And mm. I guess also being in a convent school with Irish nuns, everything was tip top shape. And then I went to a very English boarding school. Yeah. Uh, or girls, it just n never occurred to me that, you know, a lady should be demure and quiet and submissive. It was mm. very much go out there and get your world. Yeah, yeah. And I brought that to my workplace and became another workaholic, which I advise many young women not to do these days. Mm -hmm. You've got to have life balance. Yeah. It sounds like your upbringing, being brought up by a single father, that somewhat, I guess, helped you in terms of living in the man's world and, and succeeding within the man's world. There was no failure. There was no room for failure. It was yeah. about school, books. We all knew. He used to say, this is my house. This is my car. This is my sofa. You know, you want to get yours? Go out there and get it. Yeah, so even my yeah. first job when I started working, I, you know, probably within months of working um, in ESO, I moved out and, you know, shared a flat okay. with my sister. So okay. we're very much brought up quite independent. independent and so the yeah. need for you to go out and earn your own living. Empowering other women has always been at the forefront of Mary McIndia's agenda. Through mentoring, imparting wisdom and leveraging her vast networks, she aims to ensure that senior executive women are able to excel to board positions. I'm passionate about trying to help out women but what I have found consistently is that women too, we hold ourselves back. We don't self-promote ourselves, not in a negative way, mm. in a pushy way, but in a way of saying, hey, I can do this. Mm. Volunteer, be open to being sent outside for assignments. Mm. Um, do a little bit more to be noticed. Uh, claim your own success instead of saying, oh, the team did that. Oh, the team was very good. It's okay. nice to say the team, but sometimes you need to, to step up and say, yes, I'm able to do this and I've done this. I think I should get this opportunity. There's this book I like where it says, you know, women don't ask. And it's so true, women don't ask. Why don't we ask? We wait to be recognized. Yeah. I think it's part of our nurturing yeah. spirit, part of who we are. We, we know, we say, if somebody knows I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, you know, they surely they recognize me for it. Instead of saying no, 
I think it's my turn, go to your boss and say, hey, I think you know, I should be up for the next promotion. So you'll find even when you're going for a job and you're both the same level, same university graduating or going for a new job, yeah. the man most of the time, 90% of the time will get more pay than the woman because the man negotiates, he asks. Mm -hmm. Women don't ask and we tend to work more and are better, but we don't ask. And what I tell women is you have to develop that sense of self-confidence, value yourself a little bit more, don't give it out mm. the glory to other people mm. take your rightful share of that glory mm. and say I can do this yeah. if you're good at something then say I'm good at this I'm mm. a good accountant I'm a very good lawyer yeah I have my achievements are one two three four yeah that's what I can that's the value I can bring on the table mm. people say oh they take you seriously but when you're saying well I'm not so good I'm not sure I think I can do it yeah I guess the issue is most women feel like if they're doing that it's boasting it, it's it's yes too much it's that's been it. too forward you know? is yeah. boasting yeah. because we've been brought up to and be. cultured to be mm. subservient, to be retiring, mm. to be nurturing, to support other people. Yeah. And yeah. we can continue doing that in our private lives. Absolutely. Yeah. But when you're in business, you're there because of who you are, not because of your gender. Mm. You are in that position because you're an officer of the company, not because you're a woman. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. Which is true. <laughs> However, the yes. other side of it is in terms of women empowering mm -hmm. other women is yeah. we tend to get the flack of we don't like, you know, we go out of our way to not help other women. Yeah. So it's very, um, it's like a minefield yeah. in terms of the corporate world and women. I think that's a myth that's propagated by men because if you look at women, they really come together and work very well together. So why is it when they're in business, they don't? I'm sure yeah. there are instances where women don't promote each other, mm. but I've seen myself and others, when you hire a woman, you suddenly find more women coming in. Kenya is endowed with a wealth of natural and human resources. And like many other African countries, its potential for economic growth is largely dependent on the sustainable management of those resources. We just became a middle income country. We have fantastic potential. We're a maritime nation. We're geographically located so well. We have minerals. We've just found oil. Mm -hmm. um, we have coal. We have wind power, we have ocean that we could harness, we have lots of things that we could do. What mm. you need is the capacity of the people. Mm. A, to understand what the extractive industry and the natural resource industry is all about. People, and that they're as local as possible. You have investors, but you must invest in your own capacity. You must have a vision of how do we want these resources to work for us and have strong leadership that has a vision of how will we use that extractive wealth to work for us as people and how do we leave some of it for future generations. Once we have the people, the capability to understand and then harness that, they will help us develop. I learned this lesson when I went to run National Oil as a CEO. And I was appointed when we had a new government after 24 years of uh, the President Moyes rule. We had a rainbow coalition government that went yeah. in. And National Oil was a moribund kind of big fat sleeping giant had not really been used to its capacity, had been a lot of corruption, they've not had audited accounts for eight years. World Bank was saying, why is government in the business of doing business? Government should do regulation, so why have a national oil company? Why is it trying to compete with all companies in building stations and selling fuel? Mm. So it was due for closure, and I was told, oh, go and, you know, mm. turn it around. Mm. And the one lesson, because everywhere I've been, I, I look back and I say, there's something I've learned from each job I've had. And the lesson I learned in National Oil is about team. How important a team is, a good team. Because I ended up in hospital twice, mm -hmm. trying to work with the team there, trying to change things, trying to teach, trying to show them. I came with the arrogance that I'd come from Exxon. I knew how oil industry should run. But if you don't have the right people mm -hmm. with the right attitude, and it was just drama. Until the day I said, you know, somebody advised me, told me, Mary, hire yourself a new team. Mm. We re-advertised all the jobs and yeah. we got a whole new different team in. Mm. Beautiful young people, mm. brilliant. So once we had the right team together, everything started gelling, you know. Mm. We started finding the money, we started convincing government through PowerPoints of the role of a national oil, why it's important to the economy. And it was a bed of roses. I mean, it was beautiful. So for me, what I think is so important is the people. If we don't get the people right, 
Kenya, Africa, all these places, they don't, they don't work right. Mary's illustrious career and reputation precedes her, both locally and on the global stage. Her initiatives on cleaner fuel programs and energy policies has won her worldwide recognition. She has also been awarded with a state commendation of Kenya as Moran of the Order of the Burning Spear. Let's just talk about the um, various organisations that you're on the board for. Mm -hmm. There's quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does it happen? How do you get referred? How do, do, do people just call you up and say, hey Mary, come and be on our board? Is it? Yeah, actually, literally. Yeah, yeah, literally. I, I think it's getting your step into the first one. Mm. Turning around National Oil was very good for me and the team because it really made our mark. But also founding the Petroleum Institute of East Africa, which was not there before, and I founded it, got a whole team together. So for, from people seeing that you can do that, you can bring a team together as general manager, we did that successfully as appointed. They started saying, hmm, we could have that woman on our board, you know? I hear good things. Yeah. They inquire, they find out, yeah, she's quite serious, a bit tough, maybe talks too much, whatever they say. But people hear of you, they inquire, they read about you, they can see the results of your work. So the work ethic still needs to be there, but you've got to find your way to also be seen. Not that, you know, work is finished, five o'clock, dash home, don't go to parties, don't go to cocktails, don't attend the industry association meetings, don't link up, don't network with anybody. So nobody yeah. really knows your yeah. work, yeah, so. Being on six boards, having two children, how? <laughs> and a consultancy. <laughs> and a consultancy. Oh, the children are easy now, they're teens. So one is in UK now, he's 19, he's okay. in college. Um, and then one is 15 and she, you know, they're, they're at the age where they don't need you. Okay. You open the bedroom now, no, no, <laughs> you know. And they're more on their WhatsApp and mm -hmm. Instagram and mm -hmm. whatever, but still, yeah. So the, there, were, there was never a point where you felt Perhaps you had to choose between the career woman, the mother, there was never... I never had a choice. I would have loved to be a stay-at-home mom, my goodness, I'd yeah. love to. Yeah. But I think the days where men used to provide all for us, and you just do your what you really would love to yeah. do, whether it's doing a bit of business, I think those days, for many of us, of course there's some who are lucky, yeah, but yeah. I'd love to be, and then do what I really enjoy. But yeah. I think now it's just a necessity. And when I look at Kenya, mm. The breadwinners, I'm telling you, you'll be amazed. Many, even when they're married, yeah. many, the woman's income is higher or is mandatory, it's needed. Otherwise, they won't enjoy the standard of living. And it's not that it's a, you know, double cars or huge houses, it's just to get them to very good schools. Aff you know, afford medical care, which is very expensive. Our medical care is actually very, very yeah. expensive. Yeah. And then I have to be able to drive petrol is is hard mm. but i think because as a late mother yeah i always say i'm mature late i'm like wine i everything i bloom late i had my 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 son i was 38 okay and my daughter at 42 so people who've not mm. had children I tell them don't worry they still hope was that because of your career as well that you it was them, right? I, yeah and i think i didn't know i'd made the choice that's why i was saying i was all overzealous, workaholic. Mm. I was just so focused on working and being promoted and working, being promoted and working. I didn't realize that I wasn't balancing my life. I suddenly looked and I was 35, 37. There's no man who's asked me to marry him, even joking, you know, so I tell my friends, nobody even joked with me, Mary, I, I want to marry you, <laughs> oh, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, and then I said, this is, this is not good. Mm. So I thought I would, um, have children. I mean, everybody these days, you know, I mean, it's an African thing, you know, for us being called mother of is very important. Yeah. Mamaya. Yeah. And I just felt I, I needed children, so I tried to have on my own. Okay. As a single mother, it was not a good experience. Really? Yeah, I lost two children, and that really depressed me. And, I, and again, it's because I was, had, I was pregnant and I'm being a workaholic, yeah. and I'm working, pushing myself yeah. so hard, so I lost the two children, one after he was born one week and had septicemia and then the other one six months and lived in incubator for 10 days. It was oh. even today, you know, when you lose a child, it's still, you sort of still remember. So I sort of said, ah, forget it. And then much later, I met somebody who was in the same industry as myself and I thought, ah, second wife, why not? I want children. So. And I got these children, and much later, when I really turned to the Lord and I became a committed Christian and I gave my life to Christ, and I started saying, what did I do? What is this thing I did? Mm. 
you know, and really started retaking stock of my life. And that's when I really started having a balance. Okay. Wisdom. Mm. Seeing the mistakes I'd done. Mm. The roads I'd traveled where maybe with better friends or better mentoring or better less on what we call success. You know what? Yeah. The BMW, the credit card, the yeah. nice shoes, yeah. the London trips. What we think is important. And later you realize, my goodness, it doesn't. Nothing. Mm -hmm. So vanity, as Solomon <laughs> said. Yeah, yeah. I really st took stock of my life and I said, oh, it's now me and my children. It's just me and my children. And I'm at peace. Mm. And celibate and happy. Mary, do you, do you believe you're living your African dream? I think I am. If you had asked me that a few years ago, I'd have probably said no. I was always waiting to get fulfilled, you know, mm. to get somewhere. Now I'm really learning in my wisdom to enjoy what I have at the moment. I really think Africa is a beautiful continent, honestly. It's still dirty, it's noisy, we don't have to collect our rubbish, we don't have proper sewage. Our leaders sometimes are terrible people. Mm -hmm. We are sort of not a very good followers. Mm -hmm. But it's got a, a kind of a zest and a fun and it's alive and it's got all these brilliant colors. And as opposed to the olden days when they say, ah, Africans, you know, we're stupid. Africans, we're always late. Africans, you know, I'm actually now proud. All, all these things, the good and the bad make us. We have a beautiful continent. Yeah. We're a lovely people. Mm -hmm. We just need a little panel beating and fixing and we'll be fine. Time is on our side. If you look at the rest of the world, time is on our side. Yeah. You know, we have a fantastic population growing huge tracts of land, huge natural resources, rivers. We're not polluted compared to them at all. We contribute 0.01% of the emissions in the world. We have a vibrant young, you know, young people. So I, I just have a lot of hope for Africa and we see countries getting better and better. So I, I think so. I, as I go into my 60s, if I say I'm not living it, then what am I waiting for, you know? I have a good home. I have good children. God has blessed me. I am still finding work. I may not be employed eight to five, but I'm finding work. People still want to make use of me. I'm still getting brilliant ideas, like what I'm launching, you know, Full Circle with Mary uh, on Thursday night, which is, you know, mentoring women, uh, you know, allowing them to come together so that we can leverage our networks for value and to get power for ourselves and what we want to do. Thank you very much, Mary. It's been an absolute pleasure to have oh, you. My, my pleasure too, Dream. thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. Thank you very much. And lastly, can you be my mentor? I love you. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, okay. Okay. absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Hey, what's up, guys? They call me DJ Spinner, a.k.a. The Cap. You enjoyed the video you just watched? Please, please subscribe and Danny TV. Just click below and subscribe and you can watch more amazing videos.